Mate, this one comes from the field of cognitive psychology. Uh, in about the 1970s, a professor of psychology, Eleanor Roche, developed the prototype theory. And it's all about how our brains categorize information. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna ask a series of questions. I want you to say your answers out loud and as quickly as you can. Ready, set, what comes after Saturday? What is the first month of the year? How many fingers do you have on one hand? Name a vegetable. I think more people need to know that we do actually know what color some dinosaurs were. We know that a lot of dinosaurs had feathers and some dinosaur feathers have been so beautifully preserved that we now actually have fossilized melanosomes, which are organelles within pigment cells that determine color. The important thing is that the shape of these melanosomes correlates with the color of the feather, and we know what shapes mean what color by studying modern day dinosaurs, birds. So based on the shape of these fossilized melanosomes, we know that Microraptor, for example, which was a dinosaur that had a wing on all four of its limbs, was covered in dark blue or black iridescent feathers, kind of like a crow. And Cynoceropteryx, for example, had a striped tail. I mean, these are dinosaurs that went extinct tens of millions of years ago, and we know what color their feathers were. That is so cool. Imagine you have this sheet of white paper, and you take a photo of it on your phone. That digital photo is made up of 2,854,588 characters of code. Now imagine that you print out that code, page by page. The result would take up 782 pieces of paper. Well, that's what Jacob Kenny Gibson did. This is his artwork called 782, and it's made up of 782 sheets of printer paper. And now you're watching this video of this stack of paper on your phone, and the video you're watching is made up of over 38 million characters of code. What this artwork is trying to say is that our world today is saturated with information. The world's biggest books from 100 years ago contain a microscopic fraction of the amount of data that's available online. It is kind of absurd to print out the code of a photo of a blank piece of paper, but I I think it shows just how much we rely on technology and how hard it would be to undo this reliance. There really is no turning back. My partner impulse bought a thing. It's a carpet cleaner. I want to see the junk in the carpet. First we vacuum. <coughs> eh, okay. Succulent and moist. Forbidden chucky milk. Why can't you trust atoms? Because they make up everything. This is the worst I spy book I've ever seen. I think that might be a scab. Here's a cat hair for those who wanted to see that. Lots and lots of dead skin and oh my god, I can see the bacteria wiggling. I think that's a bug butt among the bacteria. We need a bigger boat. Just the tip. Enhance. Wow, what a smorgasbord. A treat, if you will. Oogie Boogie, is that you? This has some Lovecraft horror vibes. The longer I stare at it, the more madness consumes me. I recently learned what Lovecraft named his cat. Glad I've never really been a fan of his work. Next time you're feeling lonely, don't despair, you're never truly alone. It's just that the life around you is no good at conversation. But if you're dating, you're used to that. This is unbelievable. Something statistically nearly impossible actually happened to me. I got four double yolk eggs in a row. The odds of this actually happening are one in one trillion. For those of you who don't know, a double yolk egg is just a normal egg, but it has two yolks inside instead of one, and usually the shell's a little denser. I've seen one double yolk on my farm, but I've never seen them in a carton of store-bought eggs. If you look in the bowl, the three on the bottom are double yolks, and so is the one in the top right corner. I wasn't 100% sure my math was right, so I checked with the internet, and the odds are 1 in 1 trillion. Odds of winning the lottery, 1 in 3 million. Have you ever wondered about, like, cave paintings? Like, what were they doing? These don't look very good. <laughs> in fact, almost every cave painting has spaghetti lines, which are webs of lines drawn over top the images, as you can see here. And here's an example of natural spaghetti lines in nature, but we'll get to that in a second. The second weird thing is like sometimes animals are given extra body parts, like here the mammoth has two trunks. And here there's a drawing of an antelope or a deer it looks like that seems to have two heads. For a long time people would just assume like maybe the spaghetti lines were some kind of paleolithic graffiti and maybe the animals were these kind of religious creatures that they had mythologized. But then uh, in 1993, a German scholar went into this cave in southern France and it changed everything. 
Unlike the other caves he had been to, this one was very poorly funded, so it had no artificial lights, and he had to be guided in by a local farmer who had nothing but a flickering lantern to guide his way. Here is how he described the experience. He said, M. Laper finished the story and wanted to move on. I encouraged him to remain and to slowly swing his lantern back and forth a few feet from the cave wall. As he moved the light, I saw the colors of the tectiform begin to shift. When the lamp arced to the left, the blacks faded, the browns became red, and the reds intensified. When the light moved to the right, the pattern reversed, revealing a shifting color scheme. Moreover, the engraved lines under and around the tectiform became animated. Suddenly, the head of one creature stood out clearly. They lived for a second, then faded as another appeared. The spaghetti lines were no longer a confused two-dimensional pattern. Rather, they became a forest or a bramble patch that concealed and then revealed the animals within. By firelight, a secret of the cave painters was exposed. In the space of a few moments, I saw cuts and dissolves, change and movement. Forms appeared and disappeared. Colors shifted and changed. In short, I was watching a movie. Understood this way, the antelope with two heads under the dance of the firelight is an antelope going from grazing to checking for predators. And the mammoth with two or three chunks becomes a mammoth in motion, swinging his chunk. There's something beautiful to me about knowing that hundreds of thousands of years ago, ancient humans descended into the depths to watch movies. I've always wanted a chia pet that was big enough to drive around, so I made this. Take a picture. Yeah, this. of course. This is insane. <laughs> oh my god, that is real chill. Oh a pet that takes you where you gotta go. <laughs> I found out why this one piece of grass has always been dead. My dad started digging and he hit something hard. It was a wall. Luckily, my sister's an archaeologist. She thought it was from the 50s, but after a little digging, we think it's more like the 1800s. It turns out it's actually not a wall, it's a building. Recently, my dad started this archeological dig in my backyard. Turns out it was an old building. Here's some of the best stuff we found. Ceramics, a tooth, part of a pipe, Bruh. glass with grapes, bones, a marble wrapped in metal. Is it jewelry or a toy? And a ton of nails, which help us identify when it was built. This one's from the 1830s. This is the 1880s, but we still don't know what it is. We reached out to some historians for help. We discovered a building in our backyard. There was a ton of cool stuff, but we still had no idea what it was. Deeds, paperwork, even an aerial photo from the 1940s. Still nothing. My dad pulled some strings and reached out to some local historians. One who I'd met before. After inspecting the spot and artifact, they had some theories. The consensus was it was an old gas house, which stored liquid coal for lanterns in the 19th century. Bruh. Later, it was converted to a greenhouse. Greenhouses were like a thing. Which explains all the glass. Case closed. But who knows? There may be other patches of grass that are worth a dig. Okay, so this time you want to know what the hell is going on. This is a drum carver. A way to blend fibers in preparation for spinning into yarn. I add various colors and textures to the drum, then comb it down with my brush to make it compact. There's Angelina Sparkle, Vegan Bio Nylon, Merino and Recycled Sari Silk in this bat. Ha Vegan. Vegan. Contrary to belief from my last video, this is not a wig, hat hair, or a mattress being made. Add some silk and more fluffy floof with a little spice. So I just read a bunch of scientific papers on the benefits of yoga, and I'm going to share with you everything I found, but bottom line, I think I'm going to start doing yoga. First off, there's pretty strong evidence that yoga is an effective treatment for depression. There are a bunch of studies indicating that yoga can reduce depression symptoms. There's also evidence that it can reduce symptoms of anxiety, panic disorder, and PTSD. Here's another study that I love the design of where they went into a New York City high school and half the kids got a normal gym class and the other half got a yoga class. They found that among the students who actually went to either class, those that went to yoga had a greater increase in their GPA score versus the year before. Yoga can also modestly reduce blood pressure in those with hypertension. I want to point out that most of these studies used a 6 to 12 week protocol, so if you are going to try yoga, it's not like a one and done thing. Although there is evidence that a single yoga class can improve your interoceptive accuracy, which is basically your ability to detect and interpret your bodily sensations. Overall, I do think the scientific evidence could could be a bit stronger, but it certainly can't hurt to try yoga. Well, unless you get injured, but the rate of injury in yoga is pretty low at about one injury per 1,000 hours of yoga in practitioners. Fast food, video games, pornography, television, social media, and advertisements. 
What do all these things have in common? They're hijacking your brain, and they're doing it with a process called supernormal stimuli. Let's not forget that humans are animals, and like all animals, over millions of years, we were subjected to the same evolutionary pressures that drove our brains to respond to stimuli. Because ultimately, that's what the brain is for. Its job is to process the information around us, the stimuli that we are subjected to, and drive us to make decisions that allow us to live longer and breed more. And this stimuli response is deep in your brain. It is old, it is primal, it is something that all animals share. Whether you are a honeybee flocking to a sunflower or a human looking at a bright, flashy advertisement, it's the same basic mechanisms. Specifically, the phrase supernormal stimuli refers to when you're able to hijack the stimuli response in the brain that is meant to respond to one thing, and you get it to respond to a supernormal or a more than normal input of that thing. For example, songbirds, when they're feeding their baby chicks, they look for red mouths that are wide open. But if scientists can create a fake bird that is obviously fake, but its mouth is redder than that of the bird's children, and its mouth is whiter, the songbird will feed that dummy first. This effect was discovered by a Dutch biologist named Timbergen Nicholas, who decided that he was going to investigate what sort of stimuli certain animals respond to, and made the interesting discovery that if he was able to over-exaggerate those stimuli, he could get the animals to behave in a way that seems, at a baseline, irrational, because their brain is trained to respond to that stimulus. And this is the fundamental idea behind why advertisements look so catchy, fast food tastes so good, and video games are so addicting. These things have been expertly crafted to deliver to you a dosage of supernormal stimuli. It takes the things that our brains like, bright colors, loud noises, action, and good food, and turns them up to 11 in a way that can make you to act in a way that you might not normally act. That is basically the function of advertising, after all, convincing you to buy a thing. And I tell this to you not because I want you to avoid any of these things. You do you. You have the freedom to do or use or like any of these things, and there's nothing wrong with that. But I simply tell you because I think you should be aware that there are certain things in the world which are designed to hijack the oldest and most primal parts of your brain. So the next time you see a flashy advertisement or get a deep craving for a McDouble, just ask yourself, do I really want this or am I just being hijacked? 